Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're super excited to be here with you today and really happy you were able to make time to be here with us today. We have a lot of great content prepared for you and all of us learned a lot putting this together. Um, it, it's a new topic. There's a, a lot of uh, ins and outs, if you will, and we're here to uh, lay it out on the table and try to make things um, clear and the call to action at the end, I'll say it now and then uh, we'll say it again later, uh, is to get people excited about uh, creating optimized EPDs and asking manufacturers for their optimized EPDs. So just to reset the context, uh, our theme today is performance improvement matters, that it's exciting that uh, LEAD 4.1 um, spent a lot of time iterating on this credit to create uh, a reward for people specifying higher performing products. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the EPD option to credit for manufacturers to talk about the transparency journeys that they're on and that they will continuing to be on and how they are uh, creating uh, measurable improvements. And the bottom line is that environmental performance is a key attribute that uh, architects, engineers, contractors, and owners are using today to make decisions about products. So what's really interesting about today's webinar are the two participating manufacturers, Owens Corning, and advanced fiber technology. Uh, they both make different types of insulation products. Uh, they couldn't be more different in terms of size. Uh, Owens Corning potentially being the largest, if not uh, you know, in the, in the top three. And you'll find out about AFT, uh, one manufacturing facility in Ohio. And what you'll see today is that uh, it doesn't matter the size of the manufacturer or even uh, the level of sophistication of uh, producing transparency documentation, manufacturers of all sizes uh, who are interested in improving the performance of their products now have ways uh, to share their stories uh, and create uh, credible disclosures uh, for you uh, to make better decisions about, about products. So, let me introduce today's uh, participants. We've got Wes Sullins from the USGBC, Cheryl Smith from Owens Corning, and Doug Luthold from Advanced Fiber Technology. Each of them will introduce themselves. And uh, just to kick things off, I'll introduce myself. I'm Terry Swack. I'm the CEO and founder of Sustainable Minds. I founded the company in 2007, so we've been in the lifecycle assessment space, the product transparency space for quite some time. And we've seen a lot of evolution uh, from the moment when LEAD version four was introduced in draft in 2012 uh, with this idea of product transparency, uh, saying that uh, if a building is simply a compilation of products or materials, if we're going to measure the performance of a building, then there need to be credible, standardized, scientific methods that everybody uses to measure and report on these two performance attributes, environmental performance and material health. And it's exciting today to see now that environmental performance and material health are part of the definition of high performance buildings. They are performance attributes. They're no longer uh, considered kind of fringe edge kinds of things that really the deep green people are only interested in. Uh, no, uh, environmental performance and material health are key performance attributes that people do use to make decisions. And given that performance matters, every kind of performance is tracked and measured and targets are set for performance improvement. So now we finally are at a place in the evolution of the industry where enough manufacturers have created their first EPDs they're gearing up to create their next round of EPDs because it's coming on four to five years for, for many manufacturers. And there are more industry-wide EPDs being created. 
So that's why this credit is really exciting, laying out the different pathways for really pretty much every manufacturer to be able to take advantage of the performance improvement gains that they've made already or the plans that they have in place. Sustainable Minds, for those of you who are new to us, uh, we're a software company. We have always been in the environmental product transparency space, delivering cloud applications since I started the company, helping to simplify and standardize lifecycle assessment, both in the design of uh, products and now in the marketing of products. Today, we are the only end-to-end -end product transparency solutions provider in the market as a program operator, we deliver PCRs uh, and EPDs, which we're going to show you today. We deliver LCA and material ingredient disclosure services. But all of those things are in service to helping manufacturers market their brands and their products to the people really committed to building higher performing buildings. So the transparency catalog uh, is where it all comes together to make it possible for the design and construction industry to find those manufacturers and their products uh, where they have invested um, in one or both types of transparency disclosures. Now, when you guys registered, we asked a little few questions and one of them um, was this one. Uh, are you interested in finding products with optimized EPDs and or material ingredient disclosures? And these were the two answers that we were most interested in. Uh, yes, I like uh, optimized EPDs because they have a higher credit contribution. Or yes, I believe these products with optimized disclosures should be actually higher performing products. We deliberately made those two separate answers because we wanted to see what was the greater motivator for people to select products with op optimized EPDs. And uh, look at here, Wes, it's almost 20%. Uh, uh, it's, uh, do my math, uh, 11, 12% more people are motivated by the higher credit contribution than uh, just making higher performing products. But the good news is that both are true. Uh, optimized disclosures do mean the products are actually higher performing. So you're going to get both the higher credit contribution. And I'm going to show you today at the end of the webinar how to use the transparency catalog to find every single brand uh, in every master format division and section who have invested in transparency, uh, one or both types. And uh, I'm going to show you how literally in one click, uh, you're going to be able to find all the optimized EPDs. Now, the other question that uh, people asked, or we asked and you answered when you registered, uh, is have you used the transparency catalog? And is it a useful selection specification tool? As you know, there's no login to the transparency catalog, so we don't collect user data uh, when people use the catalog. But the way we know uh, who is using the catalog is by who attends our webinars, like you. Answering that question gives us a lot of visibility uh, into who's using the catalog. And we continue to build the catalog and make it useful specifically for people who are getting real work done uh, from early stage research all the way through specification, uh, pre-construction, and then the submittal package. So after today's webinar, we're gonna ask you this question again. And the punchline for today uh, is we are adding all the optimized EPDs. Uh, they're not all easy to find. You'll learn more about that. The uh, reports, the improvement reports are not uh, published in program operator websites. We can talk a little bit more about that. There are a lot of them. We're doing our best to find them, but we are making it easy for you to find every single one literally in a click of a filter and you'll be able to find them. So with that, Wes, uh, tell us all the ways people can create optimized EPDs. Great, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Sustainable Minds, for inviting me. So as you mentioned, I'm uh, Wes. I 
work at USGBC where I direct our materials and resources activities. Um, there we go. So I'll just give a real quick overview of, of kind of lead and then we'll go into the credit details and, and such. Um, you know, we're a rating system that's been around for 25 years plus, and we've got quite a bit of traction in the industry. Here's some numbers here. I'd like to say that the most important number is the number of lead professionals. Those are lead accredited professionals, lead green associates, fellows, et cetera, really representing a worldwide network of sustainability leaders that we're, we're proud to be part of. And before diving into the optimized uh, EPD credit, I just wanna, I like to share this slide saying, what are our priority areas? for products and materials and resources in LEED. And as for version 4.1, our newest version of the rating system, we've really honed in on these three core areas. So products that are low carbon, uh, have positive health attributes and are circular. And so low carbon is, is EPDs for one thing, but it's also things like reuse, recycling, waste prevention, um, optimizing materials, bio-based, sustainably harvested, things like that. Health is healthy for people and planet, so not just uh, the people inside the building, but also throughout the supply chain and ecosystems that they serve. And circular is once we've done all that good work to make them low carbon and healthy, how can we keep those materials in circulation for as long as possible? Um, and let me just go back one. We like to say that uh, for, for LEE, we often say better buildings, better lives. That's one of our catchphrases. But I like to extend that to better materials, better lives, because what we're talking about here is not just some abstract concept, the idea of improving embodied carbon and lowering carbon through products and, and increasing the health and of ecosystems and people and circularity, those all affect the people throughout the supply chain. It's not just us at the end use, it really is everybody along that chain. So as we improve and make better products for people and planet, it helps everyone. Um, so just quickly, LEED has been around for, as I mentioned, quite a while. And I want to focus in on lead version 4 and 4.1. V4 is where we introduced these concepts of transparency and optimization for things like EPDs that probably many of you are very familiar with. Lead version 4.1 is our current version of the rating system. It's in beta mode right now, meaning we've been working on those credits for a number of a uh, couple of years now, and we're tweaking and making final adjustments to them before they go out to ballot. And importantly, those credits we've been working on to make better as we go, rather than putting them out there and, and figuring out if they work or not later, we've been using them as beta. And a big way we do that is through credit substitutions. So most projects today are registered under lead version four. And while version four is out there, we don't have a lot of projects that have registered wholesale for the beta rating system. So what we're doing is allowing project teams to substitute individual credits, as many as they like, to the 4.1 version. And 4.1 are, again, the most kind of up-to-date, we've updated standards, we've improved some of the credit criteria. Um, and importantly, we found in version four, the materials and product related credits were some of the least used in the whole rating system, including EPD, especially like option two. Uh, so when we were working on 4.1, we sought to, to figure out if we could improve the uptake of those credits and get more people excited and interested in those. So as of just a few days ago, um, I was looking at the credit substitution stats and here we, here, here's where we go. We almost have 5,000 projects, unique projects that have substituted credits and almost 20,000 total substitutions. And of those, more than half are of, from the materials and resources and low emitting materials category. So it's the products and materials related credits are the most substituted in the rating system. So what that tells us is we've hopefully made improvements that, that lots of you are interested in and excited about the credits again. We've also made them again up to date. And if we go one level deeper into this and we look at what are the substitution numbers by credit, we see the EPD credit is the most substituted in the entire rating system. And they represent 360 million square feet. That's projects that had perhaps considered that credit that were using V4, but now that there's version 4.1, they have decided to go for it again. So going from some of the least used credits in the rating system, those, these are now some of the most used. And I would say in total, these product and material, these four product material rated credits are about 1.2 billion square feet of, of project area that are seeking to look for these products through things like the transparency catalog and other places. So it's definitely 
an important driver for innovation right now. And if we put that into perspective, that what does 1.18 billion square feet look like? Well, we have our Greenbelt Conference coming up in September, which I hope you all can get to virtually or, or in person. And um, that's about 338 of those convention centers worth of floor area that are substituting to these credits. Or another way to look at it is the Salesforce Tower. I'm in the Bay Area of California. This is the new high rise in San Francisco, relatively new. About 739 of those have chosen to substitute. Or if Olympics are coming up, uh, of Olympic swimming pools, about 87,000 of them. And then my favorite stat, which many of you may have seen before, is about 118,000 Millennium Falcons, which is about, they're about 10,000 square feet of area. Um, and my source is Wikipedia, Wikipedia, of course, for that. So you can check my math. But with all that interest, that incre increased interest into these credits, um, we've also committed, the USGBC has, along with GBCI, the folks that review lead projects, to make the search better. And we've integrated a number of the search platforms into one kind of meta search filter called bettermaterials.gbci.org. And Sustainable Minds is part of that, along with the other platforms you see here. So the idea is to be a, a kind of a one-stop shop for finding lead products, uh, lead compliant products wherever you are. We're also adding a feature for pre-verified products or lead, the documentation. Uh, some of the documentation, as you all know, can be pretty complicated. So GBCI is pre-verifying that. So look for more on that at GreenBuild. I hope, hope to have a lot more to share then. Okay, so diving into the credits, um, we kind of shared a little bit on the updates to lead. I wanted to say that this bolded thing here, uh, bolded point there, for the EPD credit just recently in April, we revised the credits one more time. This is probably the last revision for this, for the beta version of the rating system for this EPD credit. <clears throat> and we reduced the threshold down to five products. And here, I'll go into one more slide to share the kind of option one and option two, as you see on screen here. Uh, option two used to say select 10 products that have either an action plan or an optimized carbon uh, EPD comparison report. And what we found in the lead steering committee and our technical advisory groups all agreed with this was that most projects were doing very well at option one of the credit, but they were struggling to get option two. And so, and, and to the point that most project teams had even turned away from option two altogether. So we're not even trying, it's not worth our effort. So the idea of lowering the threshold to five is to really get interest again. And to Terry's point, start, start getting that ask coming again to the manufacturers. Do you have these reports? And uh, we've started to see an uptick in the credit substitutions for this credit. So hopefully that's a result to that. So when we look at the option two of the credit, what is in here? Um, there's, there's really two types of reports we are rewarding and lead. There's an action plan, which is this top line. And then there's reductions in embodied carbon. And the action plan is really meant to be a first step that manufacturers can, stay, can take after they've done an EPD um, or a product specific LCA, but they haven't had a time, a chance yet to really say remanufacture or change their supply chain or reformulate the product. Usually those things happen on multi-year at least stages. But when a, when a manufacturer has done an LCA, how can we take that information they've gained from it where the biggest impacts are and start to commit publicly to making changes towards embodied carbon? And that's what an action plan is. And we're seeing more and more manuf manufacturers with these and they're worth half a product at this point. Then when you look at the reductions in embodied carbon, the first kind of tier there is just do a comparative assessment, you know, a product specific or an industry wide and, and then a, another EPD on top of that that's newer show a comparison between the two, any reduction. We just wanna see that comparison, start getting these EPDs on an ongoing cycle. That's worth one product. If you show a 10% reduction when doing that comparative analysis, it's worth 1.5 products. And the best in class is a 20% plus reduction in the global warming potential, plus reductions in other impact categories. And those, as you kind of see in the language here, have to be based on product specific EPDs or LCAs. Cannot use an industry wide for your baseline. Uh, and those are worth two products. We know that's pretty uh, exceptional to find products that have had the time and the ability to save that much carbon on their reformulations or whatnot. Uh, but that's where we're kind of pointing a light towards best in class. Now, one level deeper into this, and um, 
the action plans are something, again, they're worth half a product. They are a standalone report. This is important. We've had some manufacturers that would, or, or some project teams that would send us a letter from a manufacturing saying, yes, we've done a disclosure and we plan to make changes. Well, it actually has to have a bunch more information in there to be a considered an action plan that's compliant with our criteria. Um, so it's gotta be based on an LCA that's compliant with option one. They're valid up to four years and they have to be developed by someone with LCA expertise. It doesn't have to be a, a third party practitioner per se. It could be somebody at the company or organization that's done and, and is familiar with LCA. And it has to also be signed by a company executive, somebody in charge of maybe the business unit or the product line or something to show that there's a commitment from the top towards this public, again, report and disclosure towards actions. Uh, there's other things in here. There's a summary of the LCA impacts that you have to share, as well as have a link to the underlying LCA data, whether that's an EPD or a product specific. And there's also a narrative uh, that has to be include some specific things and a timeline with dates for actions to be achieved. And the full details are in this website link here. I think we can put that in chat, um, but it's also in the slides that you can get afterward. Uh, and we do have, we published a sample action plan, which is on the credit library, usgbc.org. And it has this document here, which is basically a screenshot of the sample action plan. So it's an, it's an idea for manufacturers that are interested in learning more about how a compliant report can look and what are the requirements. Uh, those are the places to look. And then if we go to option two for reductions in embodied carbon, uh, these are worth again, up to two products. They're another standalone product, standalone document. So this is not a, an EPD with just some narratives. It has to be a comparative assessment that's a separate document with a unique document ID so there's something to attach to and, and everyone can look at. Um, the baseline, as I mentioned, is an LCA or EPD. And the manufacturer inventory is only eligible up to 1.5 products, because again, we're looking for the best in class or that product to product, very specific comparison with improvements. But improving over an uh, industry-wide average is also um, is good. And I think I said manufacturer inventory, that should say industry-wide is really what we meant to say there. Uh, the optimized strategies must be, this is an important one too, must be under the manufacturer's control. So something like a software change or you're in a region where the grid is getting cleaner over time, you can't take credit for that unless it's something the manufacturer has actively done to improve performance, like they've installed solar or they've chosen green energy or something as a contract. Um, and then you see some other things here. There's a comparative analysis has to be in there, which shows the GWP improvements and specifics, and it must be third-party verified. Now we get questions about this quite a bit, and we've revised the criteria to make it hopefully more clear in the reference guide that the comparative analysis can be created by the same person or team, sorry, the same team that does your LCA and or EPD, but it has to be someone else at that company. So you kind of see the third party verifier of the life cycle comparisons and the narratives must be different from the individual that created the LCA or EPD. So again, there's more details there, but the idea is not to have another step after you've created a, an optimized EPD to have to go get someone else completely new to redo all of that. But we do wanna get away from some of the conflicts of interest that may happen if something is just done and verified by one person. We can talk about more of this as we go. Last thing I'll mention is that we have a pilot credit for circular products, which is really exciting. It looks at more than just recycled content and getting into supply chains and zero waste and et cetera and closed loop products. But within the design for circularity piece, there is a pathway for EPDs. And so if you're developing EPDs, we're giving credit, essentially more credit for those that include, include the kind of end of life and disposal phases in your LCA and have take back and, and disassembly instructions in the product documentation. Um, so I think with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. There's some resources here on this slide and just happy to answer questions as we go. Thank you. Thank you, Wes, and thank you for really the, the challenging work that you've put in uh, over the last several years to sort this out. It has been complex and we appreciate uh, where you've taken it. Well, up next, Cheryl is going to tell you about how 
she and folks at Owens Corning have availed themselves of this optimized EPD opportunity. Cheryl. Thanks, Terry. So um, thanks for the opportunity to share today. Um, I'll just start with a little bit about myself. So I'm an LCA analyst at Owens Corning, and I'm also part of our um, product stewardship review board. Um, you know, I've been working in our R&D and sustainability space for 25 years, and um, you yeah, know, that's my interest in the LCA area. Just you know, relates back to kind of that lifelong interest in nature and science. And LCA is a very unique space, I think, um, where it all comes together, and you know, you're you're actually able to make a difference. So a little about Owens Corning, if you're not familiar with us, um, we're a $7 billion company. We have 19,000 or so employees. We're in 33 different countries globally, and we're part of the Fortune 500. And so our products that we have, we're in kind of three major business areas. So the insulation that Terry mentioned earlier, um, we also have a business focused on roofing and then the composite glass reinforcements um, that are in so many of the reinforced plastics that you, you see in a lot of different things. So our... Um, a little more about our products. We have, um, uh, within our insulation business, we have our Fomular um, NGX product, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later as well. This is one of our new products that launched this year where we have um, changed out the blowing agent, and so I'll share more about that. Um, but a lot of these products, um, you know, on this particular slide, um, speak to our goal as a company of reducing our environmental footprint um, while trying to expand the product handprint so that positive impact these products can have um, as people use them. Um, we have a line of stone wool product that we recently launched in Europe that is um, actually a carbon neutral product. Um, our residential fiberglass insulation um, that was our first optimized product, and I'll, I'll share more about that as well. But, you know, even though glass can be a uh, rather intense material to make the energy that it can save during its lifetime, you know, you're saving twice the amount of energy, 12 times the amount of energy in that first year um, as it actually takes to make it. Um, our composite products, we sell into the wind market as one of the major markets, and so trying to make that renewable energy more affordable. Um, and within our roofing, the cool shingles that we sell help to reduce energy. From a product transparency standpoint, um, most of what we've published so far around um, our different transparency documents have been very market driven. So um, these tend to focus around our insulation that goes into buildings as well as around our shingle products. So we have EPDs, um, we have optimization summaries for um, a couple of our products, things around recycle content, health product declarations, declare labels, green guard. Um, and so all of these are things that we are doing as a manufacturer um, to have uh, more sustainable products out in the market. And you're able to find those. We have a listing within Sustainable Minds, so you're able to find that um, on our page. And from an optimized standpoint, um, Terry is going to show later the filter um, to be able to easily bring those up and find those products. So the first product I wanted to share uh, with you about today was, this was our first optimization, and it was for our pink fiberglass insulation. 
and this is a blanket insulation product. And we were able to do this when we updated our EPD. Um, we had an EPD originally back in 2012 for this product. And when uh, it had expired and we went to create that new EPD, we were able to take advantage of improved efficiencies um, in raw materials and our transportation um, and all of that. And so I'm just going to step you through the optimization addenda. Um, we certified this with UL. And so the you're, you're able to see the general information that's here. Um, you're also able, it has the summary information um, around what we compared and our comparability criteria. So as part of this project, um, since the product category rules for creating this EPD had been updated, there were some things we needed to do with our LCA um, to make that comparison be robust, to make sure we weren't um, seeing any of those differences that Wes mentioned earlier around changes um, that were happening either in the software or something else. And so all of that information is available um, in here along with our new EPD results, our old EPD results that had been restated to make sure we were updating all that background information. Um, and so this included things like updating our eco-invent processes that we were using as part of the LCA, making sure we ran the results using the same method and the same version of the software. And so as part of this, this is half of the document um, basically that was prepared. The other half is the summary document, which is a two-page document that gives you a quick look um, at how the results compare, which stages we see savings in, and what the different comparability criteria are. Um, and so I'll just share, kind of zoom in on what those numbers look like. And so we're able to see with this product, we were able to get across the board savings, you know, and a lot of this was driven, as I mentioned earlier, around, you know, efficiency improvements in the product um, that allowed us, you know, basically to insulate um, more with less product. And I will mention that in addition to the global warming potential that we see savings on as part of the EPD, we do have um, additional savings on our carbon footprint through, uh, we have power purchase agreements with wind electricity. And so that certification, we have an additional reduction on that. Just due to the way the product category rules are currently written, that's not something we're able to pull into our EPD at this time. Um, so just want to share that, you know, that additional savings is available um, to really try and uh, make our product have the smallest footprint um, we're able to, to have while still delivering that performance. Uh, the other product, and this was a new product that we launched at the beginning of the year, and this is our extruded polystyrene uh, foam board. And in this, rather than updating an old EPD, this is actually a new product. So we're comparing um, a new product against our legacy um, classic product that's been on the market. And the change we made here is around the blowing agent. Um, those of you that are familiar with um, blowing agents and this, you know, this sort of foam insulation can realize that the global warming potential from there can have a big impact on the, the embodied carbon you're seeing as part of the product. Um, and what you'll see when, um, as you look at the numbers, we had some trade-offs in this case. So we had a very large savings, you know, over 80% um, savings for the global warming potential, um, but we had some increases in our other indicators. And so while this is still a good story overall, um, you know, it does show how 
you know, transportation of those materials, you know, the new blowing agent comes from farther away, um, and also those local electricity grids of where we're producing our products um, can have a big impact. And so that was where we were seeing some of these increases just because of, uh, you know, kind of that different production blend um, since we are still producing both products. Um, we also have the certification here, so that additional 3% um, savings in this case, just because um, with that petrochemical base, that polystyrene does have a little bit higher um, footprint to begin with, so we don't see quite as much savings with the electricity. Um, so, you know, Part of the learnings when we went through this process was just understanding, you know, we saw with the first one that those efficiency improvements we were pursuing anyway because they were cost savings, you know, they were helping that environmental footprint. And so, you know, we're able to win on both fronts there very easily. But, you know, as we realized with the second project that you know, there really are trade-offs when we start looking at every part of the life cycle. So looking at production locations, looking at sourcing, um, you know, and we also know that we have additional opportunities, you know, as PCRs get updated um, around those rules to try and find ways to recognize manufacturers who are sourcing renewable energy. Um, and find a way to kind of talk about that and tell that story because we're greening our operations. It's just a little challenging to get that message out. One of the other things that I wanted to share today just around improvements and innovation is, you know, as we're working toward our goals um, around, you know, making products that have more of a positive impact and how they're used while trying to reduce the negative impact from operations is we need to go back to product design and have a way to enable our product designers to think about um, how to drive life cycle changes at those really early stages. And so, um, we launched, we had a cross-functional team last year that developed the eco-design strategy wheel and that's been launched this year and is rolling out to the teams where we're looking at, um, this is based on the Ocala wheel. Um, we've just customized it to, you know, apply to our company and our particular goals. Um, but asking those questions, you know, at the early stage, are there ways we can make this product differently, use this product differently, um, different end of life solutions we can look for, different ways to reduce that impact during manufacture. So all of these different stages are ways we're still working to, you know, have those next opportunities to be able to have more optimized products. And, you know, as you're looking at products and thinking about products, you know, having, selecting products that have that transparency information really does encourage us as manufacturers to continue to invest in these disclosures. You know, that's the multi-attribute optimization, um, you know, that, that option to credit that, um, you know, Wes talked about earlier. You know, that was that was presented as a challenge to us. That was something that, you know, marketing said, can we do this? This is something we can meet and look at. And that was, you know, as we were able to look through, um, you know, what we had and what our savings were, you know, it became a good story for us. And it's something as we continue, you know, on our reporting and on our transparency that we always look to see, do we have an opportunity to talk about our products this way? Um, and to, to make these kind of claims um, because we see that, you know, this is going to allow the builders um, to meet those green building goals, um, to be able to, you know, meet the newer versions of LEED. And, you know, we're always happy when our customers are happy. Um, and it's just having the market recognize the value of these products um, and be willing to specify them that, you know, that's really going to be, I think, what's going to help drive change in this area. 
So, you know, if people aren't interested in buying them, then we're, you know, it makes it uh, a challenge to try and make them and push them out on folks. So um, hopefully this has been, uh, you know, helpful for you to hear our story and, you know, look forward to hearing any questions at the end. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And um, just to remind everyone, the session is being recorded. You will get a link. Uh, we are answering questions in the chat panel. If you put them in, and if we don't get them answered, we definitely will follow up with you, get those answered. We have some questions of our own as you exit, and there's also the opportunity to leave any other comments or questions on your way out. So please avail yourselves of that opportunity as well. So um, great story, Cheryl. And now, Doug, let's hear about advanced fiber technology. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, oops. I'm the manager, oops, went too far there, manager and former owner of Advanced Fiber Technology. It was formed in 1988, was actually a small family business uh, formed around the design and installation of processing equipment to convert waste paper into cellulose insulation. And 2018, we are inquired by installed building products. For those of you who are not familiar with installed building products, they have about approximately 170 plus locations throughout uh, the United States, primarily installing insulation. Uh, they have one manufacturing location of which Advanced Fiber happens to be that one location. And nationwide, they've got approximately 9,000 employees. Uh, for my own personal background, I have a bachelor's in uh, science and civil engineering and an MBA, which I found have been helpful to me to understand the technical side of the equation as well as the business side of the equation as we've uh, ventured through this path. I'm also a member of the ASTM C16 Committee on Thermal Insulation, as well as a member of the Cellulose Insulation Manufacturers Association. Uh, as we go through this, you're not going to find me talking a lot in depth because I'm new to sustainability. And the whole sustainability uh, sector uh, began with a curiosity on my part, and I still find it curious and it's still ongoing. Uh, Advanced Fiber Technology began manufacturing cellulose insulation in 2001, and in 2006, uh, we began uh, manufacturing specialty fibers for use in uh, asphalt paving, roof coating, and structural steel fireproofing. Uh, as we mentioned before, our operation is small in comparison to Owens Corning. We've got 26 employees, we operate 24 seven, and we do it at just one facility. It's estimated in 2021 that we'll recycle approximately 36,000 tons of waste paper, uh, that being composed of newsprint and cardboard, with cardboard becoming a higher percentage of the raw material for us. Our insulation markets are primarily the Midwest and the Northeast. Our other specialty fiber applications are nationwide, and we're located in Bucyrus, Ohio, which is about an hour north of Columbus. Okay, product transparency was really new to us. Uh, we became familiar with it from our uh, I call it sister trade association in Europe, who was a little more aggressive in the environmental area than our North American association. So Advanced Fiber participated in our uh, industry-wide EPD. After that was completed in, in conversations with Terry, we talked about a company-specific uh, EPD of which I had no idea where it was going to lead at that particular time. Subsequently, we found out that uh, we were uh, qualified for additional lead points, and Terry will talk about that a little bit later. As a result of our EPD and the, uh, uh, I'll call it the encouraging information as it related to our uh, global warming potential and other uh, attributes, uh, in the better performance compared to our industry, we decided to rebrand our cellulose insulation, and we actually call it now AFT Carbon Smart Cellulose Insulation. Uh, prior to the EPD, uh, we had uh, done a VOC and formaldehyde compliant test, 
and uh, we're pleased with uh, that we met those particular standards. Again, Terry will talk in a little more detail about the uh, our optimized EPD and the industry-wide EPD at the end of the presentation here. For those of you who may not be familiar with cellulose insulation, it's made from uh, recycled uh, waste paper. It's combined with uh, fire retardant chemicals to meet the criteria of the building codes. I've got three examples here, which are pretty common. One is a wall spray in which a small amount of moisture is actually misted with the fibers when it's sprayed into the wall. And that moisture helps activate a dry adhesive. Another technique for installing in a wall is taking a netting material similar to the netting material that you would find under a piece of furniture, uh, staple it to the wall. You'll see across the center of the wall where they've uh, stuck a hose into that wall cavity uh, to dense pack that wall cavity. And a third application, which is one that folks are most common with, is just simple a loose fill application blown into an attic. Uh, again, for me, uh, this whole uh, process of EPDs and LCAs was new to me. Uh, my thought process before we entered into this, I assumed transparency was simply saying, well, I have a safety data sheet and I use recycled materials. Well, obviously, I've since learned uh, since my initial perception that it's far more involved uh, than simply a safety data sheet or using recycled materials. Now in our company, we use the uh, transparency tool in our decision-making process. Uh, so by having an LCA and an EPD in place, we're able to have a baseline which help us measure against changes. Uh, some other things that I've learned through the process that it's, it's a hard push to my customers. When I talk about an LCA and an EPD, uh, sometimes I get too technical in the discussion and I get these fuzzy or glazed look as I'm trying to explain it. So I found that it's been a hard push. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is, is we found the LCA and EPD uh, creates a uh, framework for our discussions, not only with our vendors, but also with our uh, uh, customers. Uh, we've done a couple uh, changes since our initial EPD. And one thing that we were actually in the process of before we did the EPD was we had already made a decision for a carbon-free electric source. And uh, that started uh, actually in May of this year. And uh, Cheryl had mentioned before, it would be nice in the future if the rules would allow you to uh, take into consideration those decisions on your electric source. Uh, uh, since we've had our EPD done, uh, we've made a couple different changes and we're looking forward to their impact when we do uh, another life cycle analysis in the future. But we've shifted one of our key raw materials from a truck delivery to rail delivery. Uh, we've also taken another key raw material and purchasing from a vendor who's about 400 miles closer. We've also worked with another chemical supplier in regards to actually reusing uh, his bulk tote bags. Uh, we can handle them very carefully and actually send him back for them to refill and send to us. So it's helped us create that framework as we look about how we operate. Uh, another thing that we're going to be doing as I'm learning more about it in terms of disclosing our ingredients is whether or not uh, we want to do an HPD or a declare as we tend to look, try to learn more about uh, both of those. Uh, as we looked at why we should look or why people should look for products with transparency information, I think this is really uh, basic and straightforward, but uh, it gives the decision makers confidence in regards to the environmental impact of whatever their material product selections happen to be. Uh, we also look at the importance of transparency and each uh, individual product decision that you make also makes an individual environmental impact on our future. Uh, and it's the combination of those individual actions that will make a much larger impact uh, on the environmental uh, world that we live in. Uh, 
Another thing that we think is important is transparency should be a uh, component of the educational system, uh, not only at the uh, uh, collegiate level, but also continuing education for um, uh, those who are postgraduates or just a bit older like myself. So in closing here, we don't look at transparency as a destination. We've done it once. Here's our document. We look at it as a uh, continuous journey. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity to revisit our LCA and EPD uh, and incorporate some of the changes that we've already made as well as future changes that we'll be doing in the future. Thank well, you and appreciate your time. Oh, thanks, Doug. Um, I have to tell the people who are here at the webinar, it, it really is great uh, working with both of these companies. Um, and you know, particularly being on this journey with, with Doug and the changes that uh, they are making in the way they make their products as a result of the LCA results, as he mentioned, uh, is really gratifying to see manufacturers who are new to all this take what they learned and really drive it back in, into product development. So I'm gonna quickly show you um, some of the highlights of uh, the AFT product specific EPD um, and just what you should know, particularly if you're a manufacturer on the call, uh, lead 4.1 credit option one has increased the contribution for industry-wide EPDs, which we're really glad about because it's still a lot of work for a manufacturer to participate in an industry-wide EPD. Um, so they should have more value than they had before. So that was great. But what's important to know is that once a manufacturer has participated in an industry-wide EPD, they've done all the work they need to do because they already did the data collection and a model has already been built. That's how you do an LCA provider does an industry-wide EPD. So it actually is not difficult or expensive for that manufacturer to continue on to create a product specific version. Um, because now they have the opportunity to compare their results to the industry wide results and then tell their unique brand story. So here is the SEMA and CMAC industry wide EPD for conventional loose fill cellulose insulation. And here is the AFT Carbon Smart loose fill insulation product specific EPD. Now, Sustainable Minds EPDs, we call them transparency reports. They're delivered in the cloud uh, to their web pages. We also do make a PDF. We also deliver them into the EC3 tool, but everything you're gonna need to make a decision about a product is right here integrated into this online document. Everything you need to know about the type of EPD that it is, the verification here are the links now required in lead version four uh, to be able to make sure that it's uh, eligible to contribute that that's all right there so here's the SEMA CMAC industry-wide uh, EPD transparency reports uh, are three pages again delivered in the cloud the dashboard gives you the overview page two gives you the technical uh, results as well as the explanation of what they mean. And then on page three, which is completely optional, is where the manufacturer, or in this case, the industry association, tells the story about what's happening in each life cycle stage that's contributing to better performance improvement for this type of product and help helps make the LCA results more understandable. So here's the AFT product specific transparency report. Uh, and by the way, in the industry-wide EPD, here's a link to all of the participants. They all now have listings in the transparency catalog that include the industry-wide EPD. Here on the front page of the product-specific one is the link to the industry-wide version and gives the summary result that it shows a 16% performance improvement. Um, here are the uh, specific results and uh, the product specific transparency report was able to use the very same page three, how we make it greener because it applies to every product uh, of that type that's made. 
So here's some of the highlights from uh, page two. You know, we want everything to be in one place for people to be able to find the results and understand what they mean all in one place. So uh, that gets explained here. We show the comparisons to the industry-wide performance. Uh, we show visually what uh, the results are. We explain how those results were achieved, what's contributing uh, to the greatest impacts, how did they get that global warming uh, improvement, and ultimately, uh, you can see the credit contribution. So in the uh, references section, the credit contribution that this document makes to all the green building rating systems that reward uh, disclosing environmental performance. And you can see that the name of the document uh, shows that it is a lead 4.1 EPD option two optimization EPD. So we're right at the top of our Hour. For those of you who have another minute or so, I will do a, a quick demo. So here we are at the front page of the transparency catalog. It's designed to be a specification tool. And so let's say you're working on Division 7 products. Um, you can start right here, select Division 7. You might even say, I'm just going to work on thermal protection right now. So I'll pick 0720. I can put in a brand name. I don't have to. If I put in Owens Corning, for example, I would get uh, only Owens Corning products that are in 0720. Uh, but for the purposes of this demo right now, let's look at all of the manufacturers uh, who have products in 0720. And it turns out there's 99 manufacturers and 535 products uh, from manufacturers who have invested in either EPDs and or some type of material ingredient disclosures. And now as a user, you can use any of these filters to filter down to get the results uh, that you wanna get to. So for example, if you're working on a lead project, uh, you might say, before I even go in and filter down to the types of products that I want, um, leave the, section selector uh, where it is. And if you click the optimized EPD filter, uh, it's gonna show you every single brand across the entire catalog and every division that has optimized EPDs that will contribute to that credit. And you can tell uh, because when the EPD is listed, it says EPD plus OPT, it says you the name of the program operator. And because for the submittal, all you need to do is submit the optimization report. We're linking just to that, to the optimization report. Uh, it is a requirement that in the action plan or the optimization report, it, that it link to the full EPD. So here's an example of that. And you should be able to get there that way. There's a lot of functionality in the transparency catalog that makes it possible for you to filter and search just to find the stuff you're looking for based on where you are in a project or your role in the project. And we are um, happy and are doing it a lot, uh, giving demos to manufacturing companies as well as uh, AEC firms to your sustainability committees or your uh, broader groups, uh, how to use the catalog in your day-to-day -day activities. So if you're interested in uh, scheduling something, you can indicate that as you leave. And I'm going to wrap things up and say thank you to our presenters, Wes, Cheryl, and Doug. Thank you for sharing your stories today and working to put this together. Thanks for everyone who came and we'll look forward to talking with you in the future. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.